Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Marie McCauley from the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning in Hamburg. Uh, thank you for being here and welcome to today's webinar uh, for the 14th webinar, uh, UNESCO's uh, Global Network of Learning Cities webinar on culture and education in the context of COVID-19. Uh, so for today, the webinar will be one hour long. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the UIL channel. A link to that particular page is going to be shared with all of you in the chat. Uh, this webinar is very similar to uh, that of last week's and previous weeks as well. We have individual presentations from our panelists followed by a general Q&A. At the end of each intervention from our panelists, I'll try to ask them one or two questions to clarify any particular point. And I'll be reminding participants of uh, the time, uh, giving them a one minute um, mark so that they know they have a minute to finish their presentation. If you're interested in hearing from us after this webinar, um, you can receive uh, the content discussed in your mailbox. Uh, you are welcome to uh, sign up to the UIL newsletter uh, by clicking in the link provided also in the chat. Just so everybody knows, the audience is muted and we kindly invite people to use the chat uh, for simple discussions. But if you'd like to ask questions to participants or for questions to be used in the Q&A, please use uh, at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A option. Uh, you can ask questions directly uh, using that box. Uh, if you're addressing people in the chat, please make sure to write to all the panelists as well as all the participants and not just the panelists, otherwise your questions might get lost. And two little announcements quickly before we get started. Uh, the period for membership applications for the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities has been extended. Cities uh, still have the possibility to apply until June 30th of this year and national commissions have until the end of July on the 31st to endorse the procedure. Uh, the information for this particular, uh, for the membership application forms um, is going to be sent to you in the chat uh, in the form of a link. And last uh, update, um, I want to let you know of the possibility for Learning Cities, but also other groups to join the UNESCO social media campaign, hashtag learning never stops. Uh, the campaign gathers one minute videos from students, parents and teachers about how they're dealing with COVID-19 school closures. Everyone can participate by tagging at UNESCO and at UIL, also submitting a consent form to UNESCO in regards to the use of the video uh, for the campaign's purpose. So uh, joining us today for the webinar, uh, we'll be welcoming Ms. Denise Bax, the Secretary and Representative of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network as our first speaker for today. Uh, we'll be hearing from Puebla in Mexico, by Ms. Luis Gonzalez Arenal from the Commission for Innovation and Design in the city of Puebla. Uh, we'll be hearing from Jack Torres Gomez uh, from the city of Wyndham, Australia. Uh, also a Learning Cities Network, and she's our Learning Community Officer for the Wyndham City Council. And last but not least, we'll be hearing from uh, Mr. Balas Nemet from Pesh in Hungary, Associate professor, professor of Adult Lifelong Learning at the University of Pesh, and also responsible for the Global Learning City programs of Pesh. Uh, and Pesh is also a Learning City uh, from the Global Learning Cities Network at UNESCO. So without further ado, I'll uh, let my uh, colleague, Christina Drews, uh, responsible for the Learning Cities Network, uh, introduce the topic uh, for today's session, and then we'll start with the presentations. Christina, floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. I think, can you hear me? Yeah, fine, very fine. So welcome everybody again to our weekly webinar. Uh, next week, it's going to be the last webinar, so um, I'm really delighted that we are uh, having this topic today, culture and education in times of COVID-19. And uh, of course, you can ask, uh, is this not so important or is it even more important now in the times of pandemic? So the cultural sector, as everybody knows, has been really hit hard by the lockdown and it lies largely idle and is not considered systemically relevant. So artists, theaters, opera houses and museums, cinemas, um, for them the, the COVID-19 crisis presented really a giant challenge. And uh, culture lives from shared experiences. So um, this togetherness is now at the bottom of the current crisis. And it's not because there is no need for culture, because if you look at the social media, um, people are in their homes, sitting at their piano or guitar and streaming their music onto the net. 
in some countries, people sing with each other from their balconies. Um, culture, just like any reliable information, is a decisive element for our living together. And indeed, that even a virus cannot stop. The hope is that the new and often free offers born during this crisis will lead to more cultural participation and might reach even new target groups. So to what extent this is true is a question of uh, high political and social relevance. Not everything that we value about culture can be captured through digitization. And what can the way of the shutdown in, in arts and culture look like and in education? So there are already many creative ideas for low contact formats and many of them could be unproblematic to implement. And this needs to be strategically thought much further out in terms of municipal educational landscapes. So for example, if schools cannot teach all pupils at the same time due to the necessary distance, and uh, if they're considering to set up alternating shifts, why not integrate existing municipal non-school educational facilities? So one day at school, the other at a place of education of your choice, maybe in a museum, in a music school, or even a sports club. So this could be an implementation of municipal educational landscapes. And a possibly longer lasting restriction of face-to-face -face encounters must not lead to a stop in the provision of uh, culture and education of arts. Now it is up really to ministries and municipalities to create alternative offers together with experienced practitioners and to develop procedures and measures for infrastructure support. And not only for the now, but also for the after in one way or another. So culture, cultural education must be made crisis proof. And if we consider what is possible when we talk to each other, like we do in these webinars, we will certainly find many creative constellations in order to reopen the analog public space uh, for cooperation without endangering health. And therefore, we're really delighted to hear today again from experts all over the world from different regions. And uh, I just, I'm very brief and I stop here and give the floor to Ms. Denise Bax, already introduced by Marie. And we're really very keen to listen to you uh, from headquarters, from UNESCO. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear colleagues, dear panelists, dear all. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar this afternoon that will discuss the complementary role played by culture and education both in responding to the immediate health crisis and in helping cities recover post-COVID-19. I am very pleased to see that uh, Luis Gonzalez Arenal is uh, with us from Puebla, Puebla, which is uh, a city part of uh, several networks of which the uh, UNESCO Creative City Network. My name is Denise Bax, and uh, I head the Secretariat of the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, and uh, I coordinate also the work of the UNESCO Cities Platform. Today, my presentation will focus on uh, the different responses, the different initiatives undertaken by the Creative Cities in response to COVID-19. And uh, to see how cities are utilizing the power of culture, creativity, artistic education to deal with challenges brought by this current pandemic. The UNESCO Creative City Network was created in 2004 to promote cooperation with and among cities that have identified creativity as a strategic factor for sustainable development. Today, the network is composed of 246 cities from over 80 countries in seven creative fields, crafts and folk arts, design, gastronomy, film, literature, 
music and media arts. By joining the network, cities acknowledge their commitment to integrate culture and creativity in their strategy and education plan. More than ever, in times crises such as the one that we are experiencing now, solidarity and cooperation are key in finding solutions and responses. As I mentioned before, the network is a platform that provides for the member cities a space for sharing their good practices and at the same time to learn from others. In mid-March, UNESCO launched a call among the member cities to gather the initiatives undertaken at the city level in response to COVID-19. We have received many, many, many initiatives. If I'm not mistaken, today we are around 100 initiatives from cities in different parts of the world that are in different stages of the health crisis. The collected responses display through initiatives how cities are addressing the economical, cultural, environmental, educational impact of the current crisis. In line with the topic of today, I am very pleased to share with you some initiatives that we received from uh, uh, the cities. For example, Bogota, UNESCO Creative City of Music, has developed a project to reinforce social and intergenerational ties during the confinement period, thanks to a project called Experimental Lab Family Knowledge. Another one in Terrassa in Spain, a UNESCO Creative City of Film, has launched an initiative, Young at Home Films, to highlight how creativity and film literacy can be used worldwide to combat the pandemic. En Galiba, in France, a UNESCO Creative City of Media Arts has provided access to a variety of digital services to its inhabitant and at the same time to develop a project a MOOC on art and digital creation. Hangzhou in China, UNESCO Creative City of Crafts and Folk Art has developed a project through storytelling and digital technology. This initiative aims to make inhabitants aware of the city's rich heritage and increases the visibility and access to intangible cultural heritage. In Yamagata, Japan, UNESCO Creative City of Film encourages its youth to engage in the film sector to tackle the lack of employment opportunities for the young populations. And another one, the last one, I, I stopped here with the examples. Morella in Mexico, Creative City of Music, launched a new campaign, Cultura en tu casa, Culture in your home, to further create synergies between art teachers and cultural institutions. So in addition of all of these initiatives, so it's part of this, of uh, the initiatives that we received, last week there was uh, international, the celebration of the international arts education further highlights the importance of arts as an essential component of a holistic education for the full development of all individuals. UNESCO aims to promote arts education to promote social cohesion and tolerance in our connected societies. So with all of these uh, examples, um, you can see how UNESCO considers culture as a key actor in promoting different forms of education that includes early childhood development and care to professional trainings and lifelong learning. I am also pleased to, to share with you that all of these initiatives 
will be collected and gathered in one publication. And I would be very pleased to, to share with you this e-publication in the coming weeks. I would also like to bring <coughs> your attention to the fact that UNESCO has a holistic vision towards urban sustainable development, bringing together different stakeholders and actors across different UNESCO program and networks. In this sense, UNESCO launched the UNESCO Cities Platform to bring together all programs, all UNESCO programs and network related to cities including the UNESCO Creative Cities Network and the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities. I would also like to inform you that we are organizing at the end of June an online a virtual meeting to promote dialogue and exchange among the different city stakeholders. I will give you with my colleagues in the coming days and weeks, more detailed information regarding this uh, online meeting. And I warmly encourage you to participate in this forthcoming meeting. This upcoming online meeting will build on cities' immediate response to COVID-19, but more importantly, focus on how cities will emerge from the crisis and how cities move forward to achieve the sustainable development goals outlined in the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. That was just perfectly on time. Well done. Uh, uh, Thank you so much for, for really opening the floor with a lot of different initiatives and examples. A lot of questions come to mind, to be quite honest with you, and I think these questions will also maybe be addressed later on. Um, I'm not sure, you know, you mentioned so many digital initiatives, uh, and it, it begs the question, the role of technology in the future of creativity and innovation, and within your network, if you're maybe able to discuss if there's a strategy to incorporate um, a plan or to develop a plan uh, on, on the role of technology in, in creativity and in the future of creative cities at UNESCO, perhaps? So, as I mentioned before, this network was created uh, now uh, 16 years ago. So, and the, the aim is to promote uh, uh, creativity and how cities are using creativity in, uh, in uh, all dim dimensions. Because here, of course, we are referring to culture, but in this case, we are also refer referring to education, to communication. We are referring to all dimensions of the creativity of human being. And uh, what we would like to do in the next uh, 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 coming months is also to capitalize on all of these initiatives because, of course, each of us has been impacted and we are currently impacted in different parts of the world of this uh, pandemic. And so this is why we need to, to see and how to participate in building cities following this pandemic because we are sharing common uh, issues but we are also sharing maybe common uh, responses in finding new solutions and um, i would also like just one uh, last thing concerning the date of the online meetings that i mentioned at the end of my presentation it will be foreseen on 25th of june thank you Thank you for the detail. Uh, so we'll move on to the next presentation for today by Mr. Luis Gonzalez Arenal uh, from Puebla. I'll launch your uh, PowerPoint right now and uh, feel free to just get started when you're ready, Luis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, very, very thankful for the invitation. I'm uh, very happy to see uh, lots of friends in the audience and also in the panel. Marie and Denise, so nice to see you. And the first uh, thing I'm going to do, Ampar, I, uh, I am the Innovation and Design Commissioner of Puebla, and uh, the, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Well, first, our office, which is the one on the left, is in the, it's uh, probably in a very unique place in the world. What you see behind is the biggest pyramid, it is the Pyramid of Cholula, 
that has on top a, a beautiful church from the 17th century. And our office is part of a hospital, a mental health hospital that was inaugurated in 1910. So we are very, very fortunate to be there. And it's an office that was created because a former governor asked me, I'm an architect, I have my practice, my private practice uh, since before the ages because uh, I founded my, my office when I was in eighth semester about 45 years ago. And he asked me what, what the IC was the problem with government. And uh, he wanted like external uh, opinion. And I told him that I think the world was uh, isolated uh, efforts. And that probably there was a, an office that uh, was like, had to oversee all that because everybody was doing the same things. Nobody knew about it. So uh, we really uh, were um, founded as a um, distribution center of opportunities. We do many, many things that have to do with uh, design, innovation, creativity, learning. And, uh, and also, uh, we do a lot of uh, linking together. We are the office for external relations uh, uh, with UNESCO and cultural and innovation. The next one, please, Marie. Mm -hmm. uh, the next slide, uh, thank you. You know, in my office, they believe that uh, creative people, we have like a special glasses that see all kinds of connections and links of things. They're like pretty like magic glasses. And uh, we pro what we do most is uh, we try to detect uh, improbable connections and feasible and uh, between things that probably don't have it. And, uh, and I think uh, every time we do a project or an idea, we are always looking for ways to extend it and link it and collaborate with more people. The next one, please. <clears throat> Uh, we are, uh, one of the things we are doing is uh, Generation 500. Generation 500 is based on not formal learning. We are promoting it a lot right now in the quarantine. Um, uh, it has uh, seven different uh, axes, but we are promoting a lot right now emotional intelligence. Uh, we had already implemented this as a complement of uh, formal education at schools because I'm a firm believer of not formal education. And uh, for example, we have many, many uh, exercises and many, many things in this platform, which is completely free online. Uh, for example, I'm just going to mention one of the exercises, which are very simple. Uh, uh, for example, every time a preschoolers get into, a, uh, into the classroom in the morning, they have to see each other in a mirror and say something nice of himself, themselves. If uh, nothing comes to mind, all the group has to help. So we have seen families uh, in their homes in quarantine, doing the same thing every morning in, in breakfast, looking at the mirror and then say, so, saying something nice on themselves. And then if they cannot find anything, everybody will help them. So we have many exercises on that. And one is, this is one of the things we are we are doing is gen generation 500 because uh, the, the children that are in the beginning of their school years and that were born in 2013 and after are going to be adults in uh, uh, 2031, which is the 500th anniversary of the foundation of Puebla. Thank you very much, Manny. Another comment, I'm very glad that the portrait of the webinar was a picture from Puebla from the carnival. Thank you very much to the Institute. Another thing that we are doing because I think we have to promote the self-esteem in, this, in these times when uh, we are sharing the biggest uh, global experience of the history of mankind, not for the best reasons, but I think uh, self-esteem is very important right now. So we are a big program with the everyday heroes people that are not only in the health sector, but that are picking the garbage or the, uh, the one that drives a, a public transport bus, etc. Another thing that, that you can see on the right is we have a microsite where we are, we have been since the beginning of the pandemic. We are gathering all kinds of successful 
uh, uh, projects and things that had to be related with COVID-19 all over the world, mostly in Mexico, but all over the world. Thank you, Marin. The next one, please. <clears throat> well, um, we are uh, completely convinced that the Creative City is a learning city. I think we are firm believers that uh, collaboration across networks is very, very important. We have a very recent example, Wuhan, which is a city of design and also a city of learning, send us a very, very important quantity of surgical masks. We were delivered not only to Puebla, which is a city of design, but also uh, to our three uh, cities of learning. So I think uh, uh, doing work across networks, and even uh, as uh, Denise mentioned, there are seven different, uh, like uh, different uh, 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 kinds of uh, creative cities. I think the collaboration between the different uh, cities, it, it doesn't matter in which category they are, should be very, very, very important. The next one, Mary, please. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing we are doing right now during the pandemic is promoting, uh, uh, we are doing webinars also, mostly to promote awareness of not formal learning. Uh, I think not formal learning is the perfect complement of formal learning, but it has been very, very, for, uh, very difficult for us uh, to make uh, universities and schools aware of that. So we're doing a big program to make people aware of uh, not formal learning because that would be a way that they would uh, take advantage of th that knowledge, which is really the knowledge of um, life skills. I think when right now parents and even teachers online have the opportunity to teach uh, children, uh, well children or students of all ages, uh, life skills, uh, I think they would, we will never remember this time uh, in history of humanity. Mostly children will be very, very aware of what happened. And I think right now parents have so many things to learn, to teach, and many things to learn from their children. I am going to mention a very fast sample. The, uh, uh, very a friend of one of my sons had an eight-year-old that is was very desperate and so he thought it was a good idea to teach him how to change a tire of the car and uh, I think they change a tire every two days because he loved changing tires but I think those are life skills that are going to stay there forever. Uh, the next one please. Another, uh, we think that the real learn, uh, the real software, it's uh, smart people and uh, uh, smart cities don't work if we don't have smart people around them. I think this is not a digital problem. It's more like, a, as I said, uh, having people aware of the importance of uh, being aware 24 hours a day, uh, every day, of all the things that can be learned all the time. That is also a very good way to empower people. The next one, Mary, please. I think uh, this is one of the most important things of this time. Many things are changing. I think it's a time of, of unlearn things, to learn new things. Uh, this is a wonderful phrase that was said by a very important uh, thinker, not only of Earth, of the universe. And I think it's the perfect phrase for this time. We have to unlearn first to learn many, many more things, and we have to open our minds. Thank you, thank you, Marie. <laughs> thank you so much, Luisa, for a, a really uh, down-to-earth and, and human presentation, and just uh, sharing with us what the city of Puebla has been doing in response to the crisis at a very local and interesting level. Um, it, I'm curious just if, uh, if you could speak, maybe you mentioned innovation, and that's, uh, you work for the Commission for Innovation, so, you mentioned innovation and make the connection between learning cities and, and creative cities. And um, maybe if you could elaborate just a little bit on the role of innovation and its impact to, and opportunity to transform learning. Yes, of course. I think um, we have to rethink uh, the way we have 
learned for a long time. I have always said that, uh, for example, in Mexico, a very good work has been done to teach the teachers how to teach, but not uh, to teach the students how to learn, and also to teach the students how to teach. I think uh, right now, it's the perfect opportunity to change all of this. I think the physical space of a school as a warehouse where all the learning is kept there uh, is outdated and it has to be changed. And I think this emergency has given us the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Luis. Uh, we'll move on to our next presentation for today. Uh, we have uh, joining us from Australia, Ms. Jacques Torres Gomez. Uh, Jacques, the floor is yours, and I'll just uh, load your presentation up right now. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for having me and uh, hello from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm speaking from and pay my respect to the learning culture and sharing of wisdom that has taken place and will take place by their leaders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please, Marie. So where is Wyndham? We are located in the southeastern part of Australia in the state of Victoria. Mm -hmm. Our boundaries cover urban, rural and coastal development. Uh, we have a population of over 270,000 people and we're one of the fastest growing areas in our state and in the country. Our main uh, industries include agriculture, construction, education and healthcare. Uh, and the Wyndham City Council where I work, we have over 900 staff. So we're a major employer for the area as well. Next slide, please, Marie. So a little bit to speak about connecting my work to this space. So the work that we do is guided by the learning community strategy. And um, we have over 50 community partners that we work with to deliver on 18 key actions. So there's a focus on celebrating living and learning in Wyndham, advocating for equality and quality and service provision, facilitating partnerships and collaboration across sectors and innovating learning and fostering new entrepreneurial mm. spirit. Next slide, please, Marie. So in terms of some responses to COVID-19 internally at Wyndham City Council, so we've uh, launched a program that's been truly led by some pioneering leadership in our organisation mm. that have seen the investment in people as the key um, role in, in supporting people to get through and recover. And so they've set up a Stay Connected program and this is making sure that staff know that um, they have the support and are in contact um, with everything they need and also making sure that people know that we are all in this together. So after many years of investment in technology, asking 900, more than 900 staff to work from home was actually quite possible. However, asking 900 people to work in isolation with many um, people managing children at home from the school term has been quite a challenge. So um, included in this Stay Connected program, we've had a regular, regular program of virtual staff training, including a peer support program um, hosted by a staff member. We have something called Quarantini Time, which is almost like a martini session that happens on a Thursday afternoon. And we just all come together virtually and have a laugh. There's music and jokes and it's just wonderful. Um, we have also developed departmental Spotify playlists where all staff were asked to submit their favourite song and then everyone's got um, music to listen to when they're working from home from their teammates. There's access to our employee assistance program and conversations with our local workers union to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our staff. Um, and also information's been shared about working from home, including things like online exercise sessions and information on cooking healthy meals while people are, are at home. All this has been supported by a strong working from home policy, which includes technical and infrastructure support. 
as well as a redeployment policy to help people keep people in jobs and to back up teams in case there is another COVID outbreak in the local area. Next slide, please, Marie. So in terms of some external programs and events, we have developed a Wyndham Together um, website, which is, uh, we've created some brand awareness and it's uh, a way of supporting the community um, and to make sure that we have some strong community buy-in. So as a part of that, we've launched, launched Check-In and Chat, which is a program targeted at connecting our most vulnerable and isolated community members. Um, we have a seven day a week customer support service so people can call in and get advice on financial assistance, counselling and food support during the pandemic. Our CEO, um, Kelly, has launched live Facebook chats with the community, including with schools. And uh, we're working with the community groups to deliver tech packages to vulnerable families so that students who are home uh, doing school from home have access to devices and internet. In terms of economic resilience for the community, we've had a strong marketing campaign to encourage people to buy local, to encourage economic stimulus and spending. We've got a program called Win Local Small Business Professional Advice, as well as our Business Recovery and Growth Fund for business access to state and federal government support. We're also reutilising some of our events and arts spaces to become a space to pack and redistribute food in partnership with a local community to ensure food security for our members. Next slide, please. Also, um, where I work is within the libraries team. So um, community wellbeing isn't just about access to food and shelter, but also about supporting mental health, um, learning and connecting with others. And libraries are perfectly positioned to provide this. So since the closure of our libraries in mid-March, the communities have been using a broad range of our services, including a 50% increase in people signing up for free e-membership. Um, and we are offering a huge variety of programs for formal and informal learning um, for people across the lifespan. For, so for students, we have a free live tutoring through a program called Studiosity. We have ed educational programs for young children and online stories from preschoolers through a program called Storybox. We have a game, a gamers den for young people and junior chess for tweens a pet story time, family history support, online competitions, quizzes, story times, and an online kids club. We're also providing support for young people seeking work via resume or CV help program and workplace experience um, via our online volunteers program so young people can still get some experience in the workplace. People can phone into the library if they're having trouble accessing any of our online resources and we've created a special team to respond to calls and the support the community. We're working with schools and early childhood centres to offer resources to support home-based lesson plan development for our very important teachers and to offer resources to support ongoing student engagement. Finally, we're just adapting a lot of our programs because we don't know what things will look like in Australia or globally over the coming months. So we've got an adaptability to future planned events uh, as restrictions change or increase. So that's uh, our, an example is the Wyndham Learning Festival, which was set to run in October, uh, in September. We've moved that to November and we're gonna keep it open, whether it's gonna be an online event or something um, in person and face-to-face. -face. Next slide, please, Maureen. So just finally, um, we love connecting with people from all around the world. Um, the link up the top there, um, you can find more information around the Wyndham Together initiative. Um, you can reach out to myself or also my colleague, Diane, um, and reach out through email or via LinkedIn. We love partnerships and cooking up innovative programs with our global partners. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for the, the really great um, initiatives that you shared from uh, from what's going on in Wyndham. And uh, it seems like you've been really active in developing opportunities for, for all sectors and, and just different citizens of, uh, of uh, Wyndham. Um, maybe if you could just say a few words on how you're able to retain engagement or foster engagement with the different cultural institutions in a time like this. That's the timer. Um, if, um, if you can maybe just share a few ideas or a few ways that you've been able to just keep the, 
that those communities alive. Yes, absolutely. So through the Wyndham Together um, initiative, we're making sure that everyone feels included and supported. And so we're reaching out to the different, we have a lot of contacts in the community. And so the staff at um, Wyndham City Council are on, in an ongoing way, reaching out to different community groups, cultural centres, education centres to make sure that people are okay. So it's that humanistic connection that we're making and that is our asset. And I can honestly say that I believe one positive thing from COVID is that we're, our connections are much tighter and our partnerships are much stronger because when you take away competition for funding or you take away competition for going to this event or this event at the same time, you realise that you actually do have a lot in common and can support each other. And so our management has really encouraged us to really reach out to our networks, including with um, schools uh, and cultural and, and arts organisations as well. And so a lot of the local council supporting a lot of the arts organisations uh, and cultural events to still go ahead online. And uh, those different organisations are being offered support by Wyndham City Council to adapt that as need be, but still generate interest and marketing so people can still attend, even if it's in a different way. Thank you for that, Jack. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, there's a Q&A option for you to ask questions. Uh, we've had a few uh, very unfortunate comments made in the chat. Uh, so the webinar is fully locked now. Uh, nobody's able to, to get in anymore. Um, this is a bit of an issue for us because some people join in and out throughout the webinar. However, at this point, because we want to avoid any further uh, comments, um, we, we've locked the room. So if people, uh, participants who are interested in asking questions to the different uh, speakers, please use the Q&A strictly, um, uh, the little option at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to the individual participants, uh, either all of them or just one of them. If you have a specific question, uh, we'll be taking those at the end of uh, the different presentations. So thank you again, Jack, and we'll be moving on now to uh, our last but not least presentation by uh, uh, Balash uh, from Hungary. Balash, I'll be loading up the screen for your presentation and I will attempt to give you uh, control for this, let's see how that goes. Let me know. And it doesn't work. Never mind. Let's just, uh, we're going to have, you're just going to have to cue me on if that's okay. Uh, yeah. Can, you, can I, you hear me? I can hear you very well. Thank you so much indeed. I try to keep time because time is moving very quickly. And I, do I have five minutes? You have eight minutes, actually. Eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, eight. Um, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Um, if we could just have uh, the next slide, please, because this is just uh, the first one is just to say that uh, Pech uh, in uh, uh, the southern part of Hungary, you can see it on the map in uh, how it is located, the city. And if we can just move to the next one, within Hungary, it's a city quite close to the Croatian border. City is today um, with. Uh, inhabitants of uh, 145,000 people. It's a multi-linguistic uh, community, multi-ethnic and multi-religious uh, uh, to host the first university of Hungary, which was uh, established in the 14th century, a real educational city with a number of uh, schools and uh, high schools. Um, and uh, for us in Page, uh, recently it has been a huge challenge to become a learning city, if you can just move uh, forward. Uh, because, uh, well, in the last 20 years, we had uh, different uh, impacts from various projects uh, when uh, Hungary joined the European uh, Union. In 2004, uh, one of the impact of uh, being the part of uh, the European community has been to get closer to international initiatives through project work, but also to uh, highlight that uh, uh, Pitch uh, uh, tightened its connection to uh, United Nations uh, to become a, a healthy city, uh, a member of the WHO campaign. Uh, and also in 2010, uh, uh, Pitch has been uh, uh, has uh, was uh, one of the cultural capitals of Europe. You may know this very well. This how uh, represent those cities who 
try to focus on those uh, 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 values and uh, 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 cultural um, implications that might uh, work in uh, the city and the surrounding region. So um, uh, when this program was uh, uh, developed uh, in, in uh, the years right after the millennium, uh, a number of experts uh, uh, to have been working on the, on the reconfiguration of economies uh, in this part of Hungary uh, underlined the necessity that we should build on on uh, culture and uh, uh, culture-based creative industries, uh, health, and environmental protection. So these three uh, um, determining factors made us to move. Uh, uh, to to join uh, United Nations uh, uh, initiatives, amongst them uh, uh, the uh, uh, very well um, articulated uh, uh, focuses on developing cities. And when the university uh, participated in a number of projects with uh, through the support of uh, Pascal uh, Observatory to uh, enable uh, different stakeholders to get together to develop the city and its region. The university uh, uh, started to play a very significant role in the development of, uh, uh, of uh, the program. If you can just move on a little bit. Um, you know, uh, recently, uh, while Page became a global learning city in 2017, it was the result that uh, our focus is on culture arts and education um, uh, has always been a, a, a key focal point of our learning festivals that we've been organizing for four years. And uh, you just can see the topics of our uh, three previous learning festivals where uh, we try to resonate with a number of uh, partners uh, and collaborative stakeholders that culture, uh, education, and arts play uh, a uh, very strong role in the development of uh, Page as a learning city, if we can just move on. Um, so we have a certain kind of mindset, but this is, this is the challenge for my city, and I presume in the region, how to get together different stakeholders. And in the period of COVID-19, when you can see uh, difficulties within the society in, in those countries where you would not have too much of uh, uh, high level uh, uh, of understanding uh, what uh, local collaborative actions may mean for stakeholder groups, not just for, not necessarily individuals and their own communities, but for different actors to get to get, uh, to play, uh, to act together, to design and uh, plan together and to um, achieve certain uh, uh, programs through models like the Learning City, this is a learning phase still for us. And I think uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation has strengthened our uh, engagement um, and commitment to uh, those aspects that we shall have to develop through culture and education. So uh, since this is one of our uh, 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 valuable assets in the development um, uh, of the Learning City, I think this is something that is a, a good driver to uh, keep and to invite in uh, uh, future uh, stake, potential stakeholders. If we can just move uh, forward, I think this is something to indicate here that we developed uh, different programs. Last uh, two years ago, we already indicated for an international conference that uh, for learning city developments, for us, culture uh, is an important issue. Uh, the, uh, the following slide will indicate uh, that uh, uh, recently uh, we try to step forward, and if you can just move to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, recently, uh, many of our cultural partners, like the uh, cultural quarter in the city, uh, and it, uh, moved into uh, uh, social media uh, to highlight that we would need to work together with not just stakeholders, but also local citizens and youth uh, to develop their programs of festivals and music programs uh, from home uh, by using their digital devices. Uh, cultural and music festivals are organized virtually. The next slide, please. Uh, another example is the local museum uh, site, uh, World Heritage site, 
which organizes virtual tools. You can see it in a number of cities across the world. How it is a challenging issue to get the museum into people's homes and through uh, these digital advances now today, uh, not only classes from schools, uh, but also families can learn from uh, their past uh, within their city uh, through uh, valuable and quality uh, through le lectures. The following slide will uh, give you the example that the local museum, as a partner of our learning city, uh, has collected uh, documentation and uh, developed digital roaming in the museum uh, that enables uh, uh, our educational partners, local schools, to develop their educational materials uh, through the use, the active use of uh, students and their families, having uh, the constraint to learn together um, uh, and then uh, to uh, move forward with the expansion of their uh, knowledge and skills. And the last example from me is from the University of Page. Uh, is that we uh, kept continuing uh, our uh, digital uh, classes as uh, it is the Open University Mini in the COVID situation. The University of Page is organizing virtual lectures, um, uh, not only on the topic of COVID-19 to get people uh, e engaged uh, and to um, uh, tr uh, uh, trying to uh, guide them through uh, fact-based uh, knowledge to be expanded, but also the university is uh, helping the program itself to prepare for the next learning festival that we try to develop next uh, in this uh, year, September. And the last slide will tell you that our program, again, for, uh, for this year is learning together cultural uh, and community. This is something to resonate, that culture is playing a very important role in uh, uh, the city of Page as a member of Global Network of Learning Cities of UNESCO. Thank you, indeed. So, but this, this uh, I just put one slide <laughs> to the very end. That this, the, the big challenge is there for us, how we can keep these people together from different stakeholder groups in, in, a, in an era where it is uh, rather difficult to explain what is uh, the real benefit of working under the umbrella of a learning city model. Thank you so much. Thank you, Balash. Thank you for that last slide. Uh, it's actually, I think, a question that has come up in a previous webinar we had on the role of partnerships and governance. So maybe we'll get back to that. I'll ask you a really brief question, but how do you envision maybe the, the future of the learning festival for PESH for, for the years to come? Uh, what kind of lessons learned can you draw from this and what will it look like? Well, uh, shortly to respond to this, I think it's, uh, the challenge is twofold. One thing is uh, local councils have very limited budget to support such actions uh, in uh, having to fight back uh, uh, the virus attack. And I think it is something very important that uh, in my country, uh, the, uh, the fight against virus was relatively successful. We had a very limited uh, infection, uh, infection rate. Uh, but back to your question, I think the matter is that through culture and through community to work with and to uh, celebrate something. It is a, a very important momentum here that we have to highlight our strength and uh, the values of our communities. And I think when we have to celebrate, when we come together, things change really. But what doesn't change is, is, indeed is that we build our community on something that, that pe can, uh, people can enjoy. And if we understand that through culture, Learning can be joyous. I think it's a very good mood that gets together people. And two aspects I want to highlight. One is intergenerational and the other is intercultural. I think this, this is something that today uh, uh, speaks for itself, but this is the big challenge that we have to, uh, uh, to keep a good eye on, that we have to be cautious that people themselves have to develop their own program and the learning city and the learning festival uh, that we try to uh, develop is something that is built on a bottom-up process. It is nothing uh, that is provided by the city or by the university uh, to local citizens. It is the people who formulate the topics, who formulate activities, and we try, just try to negotiate and help them to work it out and to enjoy. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Balash. Um, so maybe just using your last slide as, as a inspiration for the following question. Actually, just before I get started, I'd like to invite all the participants who are speaking to use the Q&A. We'll be using that for the next few minutes. Um, there's one question perhaps uh, about all the virtual tours. Balash, if you can answer whether or not they're free of charge uh, very quickly. Well, but I think what is very important that uh, uh, the virtual tour is something that if, if you, for example, take a a UNESCO World Heritage Site is not just simply a, a tour uh, while uh, having a, a good images and uh, virtual realities uh, that you can follow and you log in if you go to, to the link indicated on the uh, slide. But it's also there's a something su supporting manuals that you can use. And I think it is explaining the background of the site, the, uh, not only the uh, artistic uh, implications, but also uh, trying to uh, get the user have a good understanding uh, of uh, the environment uh, uh, to uh, situate uh, in time, in historical time, uh, and then to uh, understand the uh, implications in, in different aspects. I think that's quite valuable. Uh, this is the source that people have to, uh, not just to use, but to understand uh, uh, the benefits of using. That's that's, I think, very, very important. And I just have, I just have said that in the webinar chat part, there is an indication to publication on uh, uh, Learning City in page. Uh, there is a recent volume of uh, um, studies in adult education and learning. And there is also a, a, um, a YouTube link where uh, the Learning Festival uh, uh, little mo photo montage can be downloaded for those people who want to have a good insight. To our activities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe uh, if, if you could uh, all speak to the, the topic that Balash mentioned in the end, the role of, of partnerships, stakeholders uh, in the context of culture and education, what, what kind of lessons have been learned from the crisis and uh, how do these sectors speak to each other better? How do we move forward from uh, this particular time, uh, especially in a time when we've really noticed quite, uh, quite interestingly that the, collab the need for collaboration is incredibly strengthened. So uh, we'll start with um, Denise, if that's okay, uh, as a, maybe a brief response, and we'll move through the, the presenters to, to discuss that topic. Uh, Denise, we can't hear you yet. Let me unmute you. Now we can hear Sorry. you. Sorry, it's okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, this is a, a very important top topic, how to, to facilitate the access uh, to cultural life, how to, to facilitate uh, the reopening of uh, such cultural institutions, and uh, how to not to, to go back to the life of before the pandemic, but I think that we need to, to rethink, to reshape our way of working and how culture and education can move forward together to for a better life for each of us thank you denise luis if you have some some comments you would like to make no uh, let me one second Luis. we can't hear you yet thank you yes thank you yes i think um the um, the best space uh, is going to be public space is going to be the champion of a space because it's outside. And I think uh, it's going to be the proof that you can learn anywhere. And I think uh, that way, uh, children and everybody is going to be more in contact with design, culture, and heritage. And I think that's going to uh, get them a little bit closer together. I think uh, uh, that it's a proof that the culture is like it's us and we are part of it, and we, we are culture. So uh, I think uh, it's going to make it more visible. Thank you. Thank you. Jacques? Uh, yeah. yeah, so I think what mm. I'm seeing in my work is that people are hungry for partnerships and collaboration. They, we um, are having people reach out so often, more often than before um, the pandemic, and people seem to because we've had to slow down so much, people seem to have a little bit more capacity to imagine what a partnership could look like. Um, in Wyndham, we use a tool called the Collective Impact, Ass Impact Assessment Tool, SIAT, and that is a fantastic tool to measure the success of partnerships 
on learning city action. So that's been really helpful for us to be able to capture the impact of actually forming a partnership. Um, I think that um, what I'm seeing in Wyndham is that councils are really a conduit to um, join partnerships. So it might be that there's a, an arts organisation um, looking to link in with a school and council has been that joiner, that bridge to help support it. And so these partnerships have not just been um, between two groups, but they've been between several. Um, and I think finally, people are realising in terms of culture and heritage and art and music, it's only now that they're realising what they were really missing out on. And so I think there's going to be this incredible explosion of people wanting to discover local art, local concerts. People are, are going to be itching to engage with culture and, and arts and education again. So it's a really exciting time to be a part of any partnerships that's bridging that link. That's great. It's really a really encouraging message from you and Luis and Balash on the, the level of engagement we can expect in the future on, on culture and education and what kind of partnerships will be formed after the or during and after the crisis. Um, thank you for sharing that tool as well, the collective impact on the success of partnership. I think that could be something really useful for the different learning cities. And Balash just mentioned uh, the, the need to strengthen cooperation and collaboration across sectors. So this really fits well uh, with that topic. Um, maybe I'll ask uh, one more last question before we, we move to closing remarks. And this has to do with uh, the technology question we addressed a little bit at the beginning, but we did mention uh, or a lot of the initiatives mentioned relate to um, um, having access to technology in some way or form. Um, is there strategies or, or approaches that have uh, worked to include more vulnerable groups that protect, uh, might not have uh, the same access to uh, technology um, around culture and education and technology at all, really. Uh, we'll start this time with Balash, maybe on this one. Yeah, I, I think it is, it, it's a hard question and it's a, a big challenge how to um, make things in an equitable way and to provide uh, valuable programs. And I think if I uh, have to respond to the, to the matter of technological and equal access, I think what is very much important, the community has to be sensitive enough uh, to provide uh, access to programs for people who are living in difficult areas uh, in and around the city and to help community, cultural, um, educational institutions to work together to get people engaged. As I have uh, recalled, uh, uh, the uh, slogan of UNESCO, no one left behind. I think that's very much important that we need to address where, uh, how we can involve those people, regardless of age, not just the young, but also the elderly into the programs of a learning city. And I think we have to demonstrate such actions. And I think learning activities, if, it, if they are built on, on this sensitive uh, focus, can be successful and at the same time, Cities can learn from each other. And thank you very much for, uh, for Louise to highlight those issues on emotional intelligence. I think this is the time, not just in the local, but at the global, where we have to highlight intelligent, emotional, but at the same time, um, uh, intelligence in a way that people understand and not misunderstand each other. To be curious and to pay enough attention to each other in our communities, uh, in our neighborhoods. Uh, I think this is very much important, especially in those parts of Europe where history teaches us that we have to pay attention to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Balash. Luis, I'll let you just get back to that question very briefly. Now you can speak, I think. No, never mind. Can you hear me yes. now? Yes. Okay, um, well, I think uh, uh, we have to enhance the analog and digital experience. I think it's going to be very important in the future. And I think uh, another thing that is important, very, very important, is that uh, we cannot depend on the battery of uh, or electric. I think we should try to work more in the analog and also in the digital. In Mexico, it probably is hard to believe, but more than 85% of the population have intelligent cell phones 
And I think the future is designing for the phone. I think uh, we have to design for the phone, but because I think that would be the most accessible tool uh, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, that's helpful. Uh, Jacques, if you want to comment briefly on this one. Yeah, sure. Um, I love what Balas was saying around being sensitive to the community. Um, as I was saying when I did my presentation, we do have a rural um, section in our um, local council where there are connectivity issues um, and people are isolated. And so I think it's just pulling back and just making things mm -hmm. simple. So one example is when schools um, are trying to deliver classes online. I know one example where one student couldn't log in. So the teacher just gave them a call and they just had a, a phone conversation together and then the teacher emailed the work and it, they weren't disadvantaged in any way. They were still included and then they got buddied up with another student so that they could sort of tag a little bit. And so they were able to still stay connected. And then that school student actually got delivered a tech pack with um, some um, an internet and a, and a laptop just to help out a little bit. But it's just being really aware, switched on, that everyone around us is feeling this and we just need to be really, really kind to each other and, and connect in and listen to each other. So where we haven't been able to um, offer an online service for some reason, we've offered a phone service um, and we've um, some sort of delivery or something like that, just taking a step back and just remembering what people um, need to feel connected. Thank you, Jack. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to invite Denise to provide some closing remarks, uh, give us a little bit of a debrief on, on what we just heard. Uh, Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marie. Dear panelists, thank you, Marie. Thank you for your thought-provoking uh, contributions. Um, culture and education are indeed among the pillar, main pillars of the human experience. During this pandemic, however, both culture and education have been, and are also currently severely affected, deeply impacting teachers, students, institutions, and families around the world. Schools, universities, museums, theaters, and cinemas were closed, and festivals and concerts have been postponed or canceled, just to name a few examples. At the same time, cities have been organizing themselves to develop innovative solutions to these challenges. Promoting social cohesion, inclusion, and learning for all generations are at the heart of the initiatives that you have addressed. Culture, education, and creativity in all its forms are essential for societies to flourish. Now, more than ever, we are realizing just how much this is the case. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for that, uh, those final remarks. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, really great presentations today, uh, quite uh, thought-provoking, as Denise just mentioned. Um, we've received a few questions we haven't fully addressed, so I just want to invite uh, some of them related specifically to um, specific initiatives happening in cities. Uh, so you'll know, you can find out more on the different websites, but also on our website, we'll be uploading the slides to today's webinar so that you can go and revisit them and perhaps just uh, use the links provided within the slides to find out more about a particular city or a particular context. We also upload um, um, a summary uh, for each webinar. So the last uh, 13 webinars that just took place, a summary has been posted on our website. Uh, if you'd like to uh, review or engage with cities, uh, please feel free to consult them on uh, uil.unesco.org. And next week, we'll be talking about uh, human and civil rights during COVID-19. This is the final webinar. Uh, there will be one happening right before that in Arabic, uh, specifically for cities dealing with COVID-19 uh, in, in the uh, Arabic region. Uh, so feel free to join if, if that's of interest and we'll be hosting a following webinar the same day on Wednesday from one to two uh, on the topic of human and civil rights. Uh, so thanks again, everybody. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next week if uh, you can join us. And apologies again for uh, the unfortunate uh, comments in the chat. We locked it as soon as uh, we were able to do so. Uh, we'll work on, on um, enhancing our security options on Zoom. We've tried our best. Uh, the past while has worked really well, and this time just uh, it just got a little bit out of hand. So we're, we're hopeful to uh, 
remedy to that issue next week, uh, same time. So thank you again. Uh, see you all very soon.